Hey everyone, uh, just before we get into this video, can we make sure to subscribe below? It really helps us out and maybe hit a like or even comment if you want of what you think of this brilliant interview with Greg Tanzi where he really opens up. Uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy it and we'll see you in a bit. Steven Gerrard, Javi Alonso, Mascherano in front of me. And they're world, world class players. You never get anyone who's successful or actually doing anything with their life who become Twitter trolls. You'll never get anyone leaving a comment on someone's tweet or something like that if they're actually happy with their life. Um, there's a big stigma over depression. Mm. Um, but it's, to be honest, it's coming more and more to the fore now because a lot of people will suffer from it now because of the lockdown. You know, they can't get out, they can't get exercise properly. And it, and it does have a detrimental effect to your mental health. Um, but for those of you who, who don't know who Greg is and aren't familiar with, well, I, the reason I was familiar with him before was because of Football Manager, actually. So, uh, <laughs> so, um, t so for those of you who aren't familiar with Greg, um, mate, do you give us a, a brief background on your, on your football career. Um, well, going on to Football Manager, I've, heard, I've got a few tweets saying I was half decent on Football Manager back in the day. <laughs> you so, were. Yeah, I've got a few tweets about that. Um, so, yeah, me, me career has started that. I started at Stockport County when they were in the championship. I I was there, um, and well, from under 14 straight through to playing for the first team. Um, I played about, I think it was over 100 games for them all around that. Um, then I moved to Inverness um, in the SPL for this for the season. Um, went then went down to Stevenage. Which, to be honest, looking back, was a mistake. and shouldn't have ever left Inverness. Um, then I went back up to Inverness so because I, 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 I didn't want to leave, really. Went back up to Inverness and then I had my best, best time in my career there. And it was a, it was a great, great decision to go back up. I'm glad I did it. Yeah, I think the story that a lot of people know from your sort of younger days is the fact that you rejected Liverpool as a youth. Yeah, um, yeah it, it's... It's it's tough. I can see I can see totally why um, you know young pros end up maybe getting into a bit of trouble or the, you know they struggle to adjust to it because you get everything everything as you said thrust upon you so quickly. Um, you've got an abundance of everything. Uh, you've got an abundance of obviously attention from people um, on social media. Obviously, your money's the money you're getting. Is, quite a lot as well especially nowadays with the lads with the lads and even lads who aren't anywhere near the first team they, they get and lads you've never really heard of unless you really live and breathe your club um, you know they, they, they pay the fortune and it's tough I can imagine it's tough for lads nowadays um, to, to really have that hunger and only there's only the certain ones that really make it that have that burn and desire that you want to play in a, in, in, in a first team um, I think that separates the you know the good and bad so I think I think it, you know there'll be a lot of lads a lot of lads who you know there were a lot of lads that I played with that were as good if not better than me um, in terms of ability wise but I always you know I like to think I always had that burn and desire that I wanted to have a career in the game I didn't want to just come in um, get a bit of attention and then sort of sort of float away, so to speak. Um, so yeah, when I got all the attention, it was tough. I was lucky I had a good family behind me. Um, I had a good family behind me who who, who stayed me in the right direction. Um, yeah, and that's I think that's quite a key thing. Because often you'll see, you know, a, a young sort of player get a big offer from a big club, and they'll immediately sort of jump at it, yeah. go charging into that opportunity, and. Um, ultimately sort of pay the price of their own development you see it you know quite a lot more so across Europe than I think in England and you know in Scotland and places like that yeah what what do you think sort of the the key thing is when you see young players sort of jump at these opportunities do you think it's an ego thing or do you think it's more just lack of guidance I think there's an element of ego I mean anyone who anyone who's who's playing professional football has an ego everyone has an ego really you know some lads will get attracted by the fact that he can say that he played for a big club even though they're nowhere near the first team. He can say, oh, I played for Liverpool, Man United or something like that. 
part of me, I'm not, I'm not gonna lie, part of me wanted to jump at the opportunity. Um, but for my own development, as you said, you know, I had Steven Gerrard, Jabby Alonso, Mascherano in front of me, and they're world, world class players. Um, I was playing on a first team, first team level at the time, and going there, I would have been in the reserves and I would have had to wait a couple of years for my chance. And who knows if that's going to come because, you know, big clubs spend a lot of money on players, especially in midfield. So it was it was one of them. It was a toss-up, really. And um, after after a good few days of, of thinking about it, you know, I decided I, I decided against it with my family. Um, who knows what could have happened? Who knows? I, I mean, you don't know. Um, I don't mm. know. It, it could have gone well. Or it could have it could have gone bad, you know. I could have slipped out of the game, so that wasn't. A ri- I weren't really willing to take that risk. Do you think looking back on it, it's, it's horrible to sort of like think of what could have been because that's not what happened. But do you think so? Because sort of after that time, Liverpool had a, a sort of a, a worse off period where people were starting to get injured, people were starting to fall off. We signed players like Aquilani, who much to his success in Italy, didn't really have a great time over at Anfield. Yeah. Do you think maybe, potentially, you could have got a, a little bit of a chance and do you think it would have positively impacted you? Um, I think I think any any chance at a top club like that would have, positive, would have a positive impact on me. It, even if, you know, Liverpool, you don't stay at Liverpool for the long term. You know, other other clubs it builds interest from other clubs, maybe not as high profile as Liverpool, and but still maybe in in the Premier League. Um, I would, you know, I'd I'd always back myself. I'd always back myself to to if I got the chance to do well. Um, again, it's 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 one of them tough hindsight sort of twenty twenty, isn't it? When you look back, you think maybe you should have stayed there and took the chance. But if you would have gave me this opportunity. Opportunity, although I had to retire early and it was incredibly tough to retire. Um, I had quite a long career, played a, a, a lot of games and I'm not sure if I'd have played that many if I'd have, if I'd have stayed at Liverpool. So it's a toss-up really. And obviously the money would have been a, you know, a heck of a lot better. But I, didn't, I know it sounds stupid, but I didn't really play the game for money. I was just happy to get paid. Obviously towards the end of my career, you know, that's where you think about the money. But as a kid, I just wanted to play football. I wasn't really thinking thinking about the money. Absolutely, mate. And obviously, you had a, a little spell in non-league at one point um, with mm-hmm. Altrincham, I think I read. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, how was that? Did that help sort of toughen you up with the physical side of the game in, in that respect? Yeah, yeah, it did. It did. It did sort of, but the standard was nowhere near what what I was used to or capable of to be honest. No disrespect to them. But I think I think I was sent there basically to to toughen me up a little bit because um maybe the the sort of dirty side of the game if you if you like to call it the the you know the tackling and, and tracking back that wasn't my at the forefront of my mind. I, I just wanted to be a creative midfielder and sort of get on the ball and make things happen. I didn't really want to go the other way help me team the other way and, and and that's why they sent me there. So when they sent me there I I made the decision in my mind I was thinking I'm I'm not gonna come here again. I'm not dropping down to this level again. Um so I did I did me month me month on loan there, saved me time <laughs> <laughs> and got back got back to the club, got back to the club I was playing at. So yeah. Uh, as I said, yeah, it felt like a bit of a prison sentence even though it was only for a month. Yeah, and you, obviously from that period on, you went to have your uh, quite a long stint in Inverness. Uh, yeah. And I'm guessing that's probably where your fondest memories of your career are probably in Inverness as well. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, we we won the, won the Scottish Cup up there and played in the Europa League for them as well. Um, and that was the first time they've won a cup or played in the Europa League. So it was good to make, good to be a part of a bit of history for the club. Um, but yeah, I, I mean... I really enjoy my time up there. Uh, it's, as I said before, it's the best part, best um, part of my career. I struggled in terms of when I first went up because it is so far away from home and I'd never really been up my comfort zone before. I struggled when I first went up to settle in and get used to sort of living so far away and not seeing my family and friends for like a month. And that's something you don't really, you know, 
people don't really think about when footballers are getting these moves around. Yeah, it's great and playing for all these big teams, even at the top level, playing for all these big teams. But there's still people like, like uh, no matter how much money I would have been on, I would have still missed me friends and family. It would have took time, and it would have took time to get used to. And in certain instances, you don't get used to it. No matter how long you've been away, you still miss people. So. So that's the tough part of the game that people really don't. Uh, well, the majority of people don't really think about. During you know during that time where you were adapting to uh, you know the way Scotland is and stuff, what would you say the key differences are between this you know the Scottish Premier League and how uh, the football is in England in that sense? Um, well, uh, for one, I mean if you look at, I mean people compare the Scottish League to like to League One and League Two in England. And that's 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 it's sort of a bit of an insult to the game to the Scottish game to be honest because the majority of League One, League Two clubs are small clubs really. They, you know they, they don't get don't get a lot of fans, um, or they might get a lot of might get a few fans, but not not to the extent you get in Scotland. Um, you've got obviously Rangers and Celtic that could, in my opinion, mix it in the Premier League. Maybe Rangers would be sort of top championship level, but you've seen what they've done in the Europa League this season, and they've acquitted themselves very well. So, I think I think that they definitely surprised a few people. Um, I've played for Stevenage in the past, and I mean it's chalk and cheese basically compared to the Scottish League. You know, Stevenage is a small club, so so yeah, it took me time to get used to, but I, I really enjoyed playing in the in the in front of the big crowds and the big occasions. Absolutely, and at Inverness, in your, in your first stint, you played under Terry Butcher. Um, yeah. So, what was it like playing playing under just sort of a, a massive England legend, really? You know, yeah. So. Well, obviously, yeah, I mean, you think about him as an England legend. Uh, with the, you think about that famous picture with the head bandage and things like that, and he, it's exactly what you get when you meet him. You know, he's such a, a, a large in life character. He's full of like motivational speeches and and you know and and really wants to drive the team forward he could go off the angle he could lose his rag as well and give you the air dryer treatment um more than most of, i think i've seen the, the neil warnock clip lately about him going mad in the changing room and yeah. he's got nothing on teddy butcher some of the things <laughs> i've nothing on him nothing on him mate so yeah he had that both he had both sides to him um, so you always kept you on your toes. Absolutely. Um, and and when you when you decided to leave Inverness, um, what was the sort of the motivation behind behind the decision? Because obviously you enjoyed a, a good first stint with the club. So so what was the sort of thinking behind your move down back to Stevenage? Um, at the time they were in the playoffs and just missed out on in the League One playoffs to go to the Championship. And I'd always fancied a goal, in, uh, a goal in the championship. I thought it'd be a good way to 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 get in there if we could get in the playoffs again. It didn't, you know. Looking back, I should never have left. Looking back, um, because I, I mean, I scored a scored a few good goals there. To be fair, in my first six months, but I didn't enjoy it. To be honest, um, didn't enjoy sort of. It was a bit of a step down to what I was used to in terms of the atmosphere and the and the fans. You know, the fans are the fans in the Scottish League are great, and you know, I'm not saying the the Stevenage fans are bad, but it, it's not the same sort of no, not even the same league. Pardon yeah. the pun. Um, yeah, so so it was a it was a it was a bad decision of mine, and it's something I do regret. You know, that's one of the regrets I've got that it that it did go to Stephen. It just should never have gone there, but you know, it is what it is. From a mental aspect, how do you sort of deal with the with the struggle of being somewhere where you don't really want to be at that point in time? Sort of uh, was it hard to pick yourself up and carry on or Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. You're in a you you sort of battling with yourself, you know, because obviously you don't want to be there, but you have to train. Like you do want to be there, and 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 you can't be, you can't be sort of a bad egg in the changing room because it won't do you any good. You'll just end up pissing the the gaffer off, 
you know, the board, and then you might be a bit funny with you going to a, another club. Don't make maybe try and make it harder. Um, yeah, and you got the return to Inverness after that. What was it like being back there for a second time? Was it pretty much the same as before? Or was it a little yeah, different? It, do you know what it felt like? It felt like I'd never left. Um, I just slotted back in, which which was good because I knew I had to hit the ground running when I went back there. Um, you know, I remember my first start was actually a, a League Cup semi-final, you know, that we we won 3-2. Well, no, sorry, we drew, we drew, um, we drew two all and then uh, won it on penalties. We went down to nine men in the game. <laughs> so it was, it was, it was some, uh, and I did, I scored in the game as well, which is, which was great. As I said before, I wanted to hit the ground running. So it sort of ticked all the boxes. Uh, and, and what was it like sort of winning that cup? Obviously Inverness are nowhere near sort of the, the top tier clubs in Scotland, but managing to yeah. get that trophy over the line. Just tell me the sort of emotions both leading up to the game, during the game, and after the game. Yeah. So, I mean, the emotions leading up to the game. You know, we beat Celtic. We Basically, we beat Celtic in the semi-final. Um, and, you know, I'd, I scored a penalty in that game. Um, and, I, you know, it was, that was a great way to, to go through. We scored in the last minute of extra time. Um, so, we knew, we knew we deserved to be there that, um, 2014 2015 season, the team we had was right up there with, with the best in Scotland at that, at that time. Unfortunately, in Vanessa aren't there now, but we, uh, we, we were very lucky we had a very good squad. Um, so we were used to being the underdogs because in Vanessa aren't a big club in Scotland. Um, so we were used to being the underdogs. So when we, you know, when we were playing Falkirk in the final, sort of the roles were, were reversed a little bit. And we were massive favourites to win it because we'd had such a good season. Um, so it was a bit strange, a bit strange for myself and, and I know the other lads. It was sort of, we were expected to win. You know, that can always have a detrimental effect to you. you you'll, you'll see yourself when, when there's a final, how many people go down with cramps. Even though they're, they've played all season, they're at the top of the game, fitness-wise, and you still get cramped because there's that nervous energy just drains you. And we had that. I've, I've never felt as tired in a game as I did in that final. Seeing, seeing us score the goal late on and in the final whistle goal, it was just a massive sigh of relief. Um, yeah, it was a massive sigh of relief. And the first thing I wanted to do was go and have a drink, to be honest. I ran in, <laughs> I ran in and we, got, we had loads of bottles ready in the, in the, uh, in the change room. We all went and grabbed a few bottles and then went out and celebrated with our friends and family. Um, but yeah, the big sense of just relief when we actually won it. Post the final, it was, you moved on to Aberdeen from there. But, um, mm. One thing I wanted to touch on from there is obviously being part of part of a footballer, as you get talked about in the press, both good and bad light. And yeah. um, I'm guessing as you were leaving Inverness, you were given the you know, by the some sections of the press, the title of being a money grabber for rejecting a contract. Yeah, during during like my younger times when I was early twenties, you know, I used to actually, I used to take notes of what the press said. Um, as you get older, you just think, like, you know, you just don't pay any attention to what they say. To be honest, because nine times out of ten, it's all rubbish what they say. Like, mm-hmm. it's it's. I mean. That when you were calling me sort of a money grabber or whatever, it was it pissed me off a little bit. Yeah, it did piss me off to be fair because I was thinking, you know, you don't even know. You don't you don't know anything about about the contract or or what you know, what I'll be what I'm being paid at Inverness and what I'm being paid at Aberdeen. You don't you don't know any any sort of any figures at all. Um and obviously you're gonna get fans. You know, I love the Inverness fans and they were great with me while I was there. But you're going to get fans that turn. You know, you can't please everyone. You're going to get fans that turn and, and, and do call you, you know, a money grabber or, you know, they slate you if you have a bad game on a Saturday. That's just the way football is, unfortunately. Um, you know, you've got to deal with the Twitter trolls and, and things like that. Um, but you just get used to that. And one thing I've said, one thing I always say, um, you never get anyone who's successful or actually doing anything with their life 
who become Twitter trolls. Mm. You'll never get anyone leaving a comment on someone's tweet or something like that if they're actually happy with their life. And your time at Aberdeen when you moved over there, um, you had injury issues when you, you sort of moved over there and I, I think that's where you sort of felt the start towards uh, that sort of long yeah. period of battling with them. Uh, mm. What what was that like for you when you, you know, you you had that first sort of, uh, I think you were out for a month or something along those lines. Yeah. Back and then you were pretty much straight back out again. Yeah. So, you know, how hard was that on you thinking, you know, I've just spent all that time rehabbing, all that time with the physios. Mm. You get back and it's straight back into the, into the treatment room, essentially. Yeah. I'll be honest, it was a nightmare because I just got through the door at Aberdeen. Um, I'd, I'd done the pre-season and I'd played a few games. And then I felt it and I was just thinking, that's the worst thing I need. Uh, you know, that's the worst thing I can have just mm. coming in and now feeling this. Um, so I was just concentrating on getting back as quickly as I can. And unfortunately, chose, or the medical team chose a, a, a surgeon to do the operation. And, you know, without saying too much, he wasn't necessarily qualified. And he had a bit of a reputation for being quite rough anyway, in terms of his surgeries. So it's something, it's something to look back on now and, and think, you know, I should never have been put, I should never have gone to that surgeon. Um, but as a player, you just are like a piece of music. You're like, you just sort of get handed round and, you know, fix him if you can or, you know, do, do this or, you know, see what you can do with, with him. Um, so, yeah, it was just, it started, that was the start really at the end, at the end, to be honest, because... Whenever I tried to come back, you know, I, I used to break down again with with sort of a pelvis issue. It went in 10 to a pelvis issue. I ended up realising a year later that I was trying to play for a year while at Aberdeen. I had uh, abscess on my pelvis. Um, during that time, I was trying to come back. I was never actually going to come back because I had a big problem there that just was not discovered. Yeah, for someone who like has gone throughout their career with little to no injuries, um, how much did that sort of hit hard? Because it's bad enough when you sort of when you when you're not saying it's what like good when you're used to injuries, but like you know sort of how to sort of get over them. But for someone who's literally had no um, sh no light shined on the injury part for them, how much how hard was it to deal with for you? Oh, it was it was massive. Um, I mean, I've spoke about depression before um, in a few other podcasts I've done lately. And I think I only feel, I only feel now that it, it's the right, I feel now it's the right time to talk about it because um, there's a big stigma over depression. Mm. Um, but it's, to be honest, it's coming more and more to the fore now because a lot of people will suffer from it now because of the lockdown. You know, they can't get out, they can't get exercise properly, and it, and it does have a detrimental effect to your mental health. The things I was going through was, you know, sort of was hell really. I was struggling to sleep. You know, I was getting people, obviously, you know, sending me messages on Twitter, slating me, just saying I was, you know, injury prone and I'm a, you know get out of our club and, and things like that. And I was thinking, if only, I can't really say what's happened, but if only you knew what was going on, um, you know, it, it, it'd make me, it, at least you'd know what I was going through. Um, mm. You know, what really, what made me worse was, uh, you know, it was, it was, it, it was Aberdeen really trying to say to me, the, the manager took me in the office and it was, his way of saying to me, really, like, keep going and, and was, you know, we apologise and, and things like that. We know what's happened. But he was, he was apologising to me for, for, for them sending me to that physio, to that, to that surgeon. So mm. it just made me feel worse in terms of, you know what, you know what's happened there. And still, he was coming out in the papers saying I had no future at Aberdeen when... He hadn't spoke to me that he was going to say that. He hadn't told me that I had no future at Aberdeen. He was pulling me in his office and saying, listen, we're sorry about the surgery. We'll get you right. Mm. And then he sort of just flips it the other way and hangs me out to dry in front of, in, in the press. And 
that had a, that had a I was furious to be honest. I had no way of. Well, it did cross my mind to just start tweeting and say what really happened, but you know that's not the way. That's not the way I wanted to act. It's not really a professional way to do mm. it. So I just, I just had to take things on the chin, and when you don't speak about it, that's when you, it can have a real de- detrimental effect. And I did struggle with with depression but it was because of what was going on around me. In terms of, say, managers' comments in the press uh, obviously affected you, do you think that more footballers are impacted by that sort of thing and they don't choose to speak about it? Do you think it's sort of a very... Do you think it's a more common thing in football? Yeah, yeah, it is. I know for a fact it is. Obviously, speaking to lads who who play the game, I know for a fact it is. Um, You know, people don't realise that you see on match of the day or Monday Night Football, you know, Carrigan, Neville are brilliant. They never really hang people out to dry, but even, even you know, they, ha- they have to highlight mistakes. And that's not too bad. You sort of just turn it off. But when, when you get this, the newspapers apps, like hanging lads out to dry and, and slating them about the personal lives and... Um, and things like that. That's where people suffer. That's where lads suffer because they are only they're just people as well. They're just humans. So, like, it's hard to take. I mean, I, I, at the forefront of my mind when I think about it is whenever England go into World Cups, there's always a story about one of the players come out uh, in personal lives, and then they expect England to go and do well. I don't, I, I don't get it. And then they slate them for not doing well. So it's, <laughs> they're just on a the. The, the, the basically, it's a no win for them, um, and the, the the press have a lot to uh, you know have a lot to say for themselves, and and they should have a lot to answer to really because they are a major problem in the sport. Yeah, and particularly when players are going through things. I mean, with your injuries, you practically had to learn to walk again, didn't you? Yeah. With the uh, injuries you had at Aberdeen. Yeah. Um, so I imagine that makes the experience just that bit tougher, especially when you've got something mm. you know that large. Yeah, uh, what was that recovery process like? Though I mean, especially when you knew that the club weren't particularly looking after your best interests in that sense, were or in a sense hammering you out as well. Yeah, well, what happened was Aberdeen just wants because I was injured. Um, I'm no longer being interested in them. That's the way they treated me. So even though they sent me to this surgeon, they just cut the ties with me and said that well, we don't know one nothing to do with it. Um, I don't know whether the physio didn't know what to do or, you know, or what, but, you know, it left me with a real sour taste in my mouth, it still does, because I'm still angry with the way they handle things. You know, they, it was un- just so unprofessional, it was unbelievable. Mm. Um, so they just wanted to get me out as quick as, as they could. Uh, I had I had a loan spell at Ross County, and despite me being injured, for some reason, you know, Rocks County wants to take me on loan and get me right. Um, and I just wanted basically to fit another physio to have a look at it, have a look at what was wrong with me and hopefully, you know, sort it out. So, you know, I went in, I'd had a, I'd had a steroid injection into my pelvis as well. Um, and, you know, I was taking, I was taking heavy uh, painkillers as well to sort of, try and do a bit of fitness work and when I went to Ross County that was when they discovered you know that the surgeon had put mesh six centimeters in the wrong place and it was basically having a detrimental effect to everything really because when it's out of place you know you start compensating on the other sides and it just everything just sort of collapses that's the way it is Uh, so when I found that out as well that, that just made me even worse. I was thinking, basically, you fucked me over here and now you've carted me out. Um, so, yeah, there was, a lot of, there was a lot of bad blood between me towards Aberdeen. Um, yeah, and, and obviously you, you had a short spell at St. Mirren afterwards. And yeah. Then, and then, um, so, did you, did you know then sort of the fact that you were probably going to retire soon. And then obviously you had a little spell at Warrington as well. 
Um, yeah, but the Warrington thing was just basically to get me out the house, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, was it was it sort of? Did you know in your in your mind in your body that it was sort of coming towards the the finish for you? Yeah, just because you know, as you said before, it had been I'd I'd been a player who'd never been injured to someone who who was when it when it was at you know when I was at my worst with the injury I couldn't walk so it was like one extreme to the other um and yeah it was I was I, I was at a stage at St Mirren where I was thinking if this comes back again you know I'm probably going to struggle here to, to to play again um so I was just doing everything I could to try and stop that from happening in terms of rehab after training and stuff like that but when it did happen you know St. Mirren refused to pay for an, an operation um, and there was a bit of a standoff, uh, a bit of a standoff between me and St. Mirren because the PFA was saying that St. Mirren should pay for it because they knew about me, me medical history before they signed me. So I was thinking, you know, it's, it's basically a duty of care for them to, to, mm. to sort, sort out the surgery. Um, and the longer this went on, the first time he said he didn't want to pay for it, my position at that club became untenable. I couldn't, you know, I could no longer play on there. Um, and I felt as well, you know, the injury got that bad that I couldn't go to another club. I couldn't go to another club and 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 prove myself or get back to the way I was because, you know, physically I was in I was in bad shape. Um, you know, luckily. Luckily, I've only got two scars from it, two little scars from it, because he just kept opening up the same scars. It looked like a pincushion otherwise. That's so many <laughs> um, I've got scars everywhere. But, um, but yeah, it was just, it was just. I think the way it ended as well, you know, it was very tough the way it ended. It wasn't, you know, that's the really side of football, really, that people don't tell you about. Yeah, and... When obviously you say you went went to Warrington to get out of the house and all that kind of stuff, um, so sort of compensating for just trying to end your career in a, in a way that's sort of in your own hands. Um, and was it an experience that you liked like doing, uh, especially as it's just sort of keeping you busy? Yeah, well, well, to be honest, what it, initially I went there because I was still trying to get fit. I still didn't give up. I was still trying to get fit. Um, and I felt like playing at some level would would help me get sort of games in. Um, I knew a few of the lads at Warrington as well. So I felt like, it'd be, listen, it, it's round the corner. It's, you know, I know, I know a few lads there. It'd be good to sort of get out the house, as I said, and, you know, try and get my fitness back up. And I just remember sitting in the house and, waiting to go to training because they trained that night and then I just thought to myself I'm not doing this anymore I'm not doing this anymore it's it's you know it's it's I genuinely I don't want to go to training because I know I'm going to be in pain so I rang the manager and said listen that's me I'm done and then I made the decision there and then really but I've been thinking about it for, for a while what's the thought process like knowing that you've you know the end is pretty much in sight for something that you've been it's pretty much you know had a shape over your entire life mm. uh what's it like knowing that you've you you know that that's it the expiration date's passed and you've got essentially nothing left in the tank in that in that yeah. regard it's mentally at least yeah oh, it's, it's tough mentally i think that's that's where the depression got 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 a bit worse with just with what what was going on around me and the circumstances i was in because every footballer has a plan to finish when the 35 and my injury record before I went to Aberdeen suggested that I would play to 35. There was all, all around that. I had a good few years. I was in my prime, really, at that age. When that cut that short was horrible. You know, I used, to, I used to struggle to sleep at night because that was on my mind. And I was thinking about, you know, how, how I could get back and, you know, what, what is wrong with me? Why is it hurting so much? But, you know, when I was rolling over in bed, I could feel it as well. So... It was just wearing me down. And so since post-retirement, since, I mean, you've, you've only been retired not quite a year just yet. Yeah. Um, you know, what, what's life been like post-game and stuff and what have you done to sort of 
carry on after that? Um, well, I had, I did have me coaching badges booked for this summer, but that's something on the, yeah. that's going to be something on the back burner for now. Um, you know, I have, I have looked into what I want to do next, and you know, there are a few things. There are a few things that I'd like to do. Um, you know, I, I would like to get involved. I would like to get involved in property. Um, you know, uh, that's something further down the line. Um, I've actually thought about um, being a prison officer as well. I actually, when I was a kid, uh, that's all. I, I, I obviously wanted to be a footballer, but I was fascinated by that as well. Um, so yeah, that's something I might, I might, I might look at uh, because I've got interest in it. I can make a career out of it, but. Probably in the long term, I, I want to get involved at a, at a at a top club academy level and really and teach kids to, you know, pass my experiences, good and bad, onto youngsters and you know and maybe give them a head start on things which I didn't really have as a young kid. I was just trying to figure it out. What would you say to a young Greg Tanzi who just just rejected Liverpool, uh, <laughs> making his making his way uh, in the football world? What would your words of advice be? Try not to pay attention what people say. Don't let it affect you because it did during me at the start of my career. Yeah, and um, I mean, what did it come? How do you sort of feel about the sport of football now? Do you feel like any sort of ill sort of will towards it? given what happened towards the end of your career, or did you still have the same love for it as you did when you were still a youngster? I'll be honest, when I, when I first retired, I didn't watch it a single game, or I wouldn't watch anything for about six months. Uh, I didn't want to have anything to do with the game. Because um, I just thought, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's full of snakes. I, I don't want anything to do with that ever again. Um, but gradually, you know, gradually, as I've you know, sort of got used to being retired and, and started and got, got over what, what had happened. Um, I started enjoying the game again. I think that's a, a very good way, good way to conclude a, a fantastic yeah. interview. Thank you so much, Greg, for yeah. joining us. Uh, where can our followers find you on Twitter and that kind of stuff? Um, on Twitter, I'm just at Greg Tanzi on Twitter. The same on Instagram, uh, at Greg Tanzi, with an underscore in between the Greg and the Tanzi. Um, yeah, so they can find Excellent. me on there. Yeah, brilliant. Um, yeah, anything else you want to say, Haskaru? I was gonna say, as with all our followers, I've dropped Greg, Greg a follow, as should everybody. Ah, else. yeah, I just seen it come up. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> fantastic I do it, stuff. I do it at the end of every episode if I haven't already done it. So, <laughs> yeah, that's brilliant stuff. Yeah. Anyway, thank you very much, Greg, and thank you very much for watching, everyone, and we will see you next time.